This is Democracy Watch. So, Mark, we've got some really scary stuff coming out of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals that isn't being reported anywhere in the mainstream media, meaning there is nothing stopping them from getting away with it, basically. Can you talk about what the Fifth Circuit is up to and what it means for democracy? Yeah, so this is really worrisome. And Democracy Docket Senior Case Coordinator Madeline Greenberg put out an article recently exposing how the Fifth Circuit has agreed to rehear voting and redistricting cases at an alarming rate. Now, it's bad enough that the Fifth Circuit is this very, very conservative circuit that we've all become aware of. In fact, the recent uh, case that we just saw heard in the U.S. Supreme Court involving um, uh, 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 this crazy effort to ban um, mifepristone, which is one of the uh, critical um, abortion drugs. Um, that came out of the Fifth Circuit. Almost everything that is bad that you see these days go to the U.S. Supreme Court comes out of the Fifth Circuit. And it's not that if that isn't bad enough, they are now, even when a voting rights case gets through, that is a good outcome. You know, the, a good panel of the of the Fifth Circuit uh, is drawn and they they have a favorable ruling. We are starting to see those cases now go for what's called on bonk review, which means rather than the three judges who considered the case uh, get the final say, the entire court gets the final say. Um, and that has proven to be um, a particular problem. So basically they get two bites at the apple. So if they don't get the the, the result they want with, with a, a three judge panel, then they can always seek on bonk review and get a full conservative court to then take, take a swing at it. Right, and in the interim, as soon as they agree to hear it on bonk under the Fifth Circuit's rules, the panel decision is immediately vacated. So it's not even like in the interim, um, you have this beneficial ruling. It, it goes away immediately. So what voting rights cases are coming up in the Fifth Circuit Circuit that worry you especially? Oh my God, what cases in the Fifth Circuit don't worry me? <laughs> um, all right, so we've got a few. We've got the Mississippi Lifetime, the Mississippi Lifetime Ban on Voting, which is really, if you think about it, um, uh, just an extraordinary um, law uh, law that I'm not aware of like any other place. There is an important um, redistricting case. You know, not all of the redistricting cases in this country um, involve uh, con Congress or state legislatures. There are cases that come out of counties uh, that not only affect those counties, but obviously establish broader precedent that then go on to apply those precedent to um, uh, to uh, to Congress and state legislatures. And one of those right now involves so-called minority coalition districts, uh, and that's in Galveston, Texas. Let's not forget, you know, they delayed a fair map in Louisiana. You know, we ultimately got um, a, uh, a fair map uh, in place for 2024. But, uh, but, but that was uh, delayed uh, in the first instance uh, by, uh, by the Fifth Circuit. Um, and one of the things that I think we're going to talk a lot about in the coming months and years, one of, I think, the big tragedies of democracy uh, when we look back at this era will be the stripping of the people of Jackson, Mississippi, of a court system that is responsive to the voters. Um, the state of Mississippi uh, uh, decided to impose on Jackson, Mississippi, which is a majority black city, an unelected court system, uh, not controlled by the voters and the citizens of Jackson. And that was approved ultimately by the Fifth Circuit. Mark, because the Fifth Circuit is now rehearing more and more voting rights cases, does it feel like there's some unspoken agreement among conservatives that they bring these cases in the Fifth Circuit and that the right wing judges will accept these cases for review? Because the number of cases that they have accepted for review have gone up in, in past in, in recent years. Look, it feels like this is a, a big problem in the Fifth Circuit, not just in the voting context. I mentioned the Miff and Pristone case. I mean, there have been a whole series of cases. You know, you could look at the the Texas case, uh, the case um, uh, 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 involving the the effort by the state of Texas to essentially run its own foreign policy about immigration. Yeah. Um, you know, all a lot of these cases, the challenges to the Affordable Care Act. You know, a lot of these cases are coming out of what's looked like judge shopped efforts at the district court 
but they're all judge shopped efforts at the district court within the Fifth Circuit. And that should tell people something. Right. They're not judge shopping these to a conservative judge in New Jersey, <laughs> you know, to then have it go through the Third Circuit. They're not judge shopping these in, you know, in uh, uh, in Maine to have them go through the First Circuit. Right. There's a reason why so many of these cases, the conservatives, both in the voting and non voting arena, seem to want to get these cases to the Fifth Circuit. And I do think that that is a concern. It is one of the reasons why the judicial conference which oversees all of the federal judiciary um recently said it's going to have a policy against district court judge shopping where there are single judges in a in a particular location um which is the case that uh is oftentimes the case in texas that is going up to the fifth circuit whether that will correct the problem is hard to say because you're right you still have the question of what what court of appeals you wind up in yeah and you know and and so i don't know whether or not that is going to be the solution but i do know it continues to be a problem and for those who want to hear more about the fifth circuit uh, all the information that i got is from democracy docket so if you're not yet signed up for democracy docket i'll put the link right here on the screen and also in the post description of this this video it's an amazing resource i use on a daily basis so please if you haven't yet signed up make sure to sign up uh, Mark, late last year, and you alluded to this before, but the Fifth Circuit conceded that a local redistricting map in Gavison County, Texas, violated the Voting Rights Act, but at the same time called on the full court to overturn its own precedent and weaken the Voting Rights Act uh, protections for minority coalition districts. Can you talk about what's at stake here when the full Fifth Circuit hears this case in May? Yeah. So first of all, let everyone, everyone just needs to let sink in what you just said, because it's absolutely right which is that the Fifth Circuit, following its own precedent, struck down the map as violating the Voting Rights Act. Now, normally, think about it. If you wrote an opinion striking something down, you're usually pretty proud about that. Like, this is my opinion. It violates the Voting Rights Act. But in this instance, they said, but we hope the Fifth Circuit takes this on bonk so that they can they can then reverse this. Like, I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Like, why? But that's what happened. So we are now facing a situation in which the Fifth Circuit, the full Fifth Circuit is going to consider whether or not to undo, undo a, a, a ruling of, a, of the Fifth Circuit that's been in place for a long time that basically allows minority uh, coalitions uh, of similarly like-minded um, voters uh, to seek protection under the Voting Rights Act. It's not a particularly controversial proposition. It's been, it wasn't even controversial, that controversial when it was approved by the Fifth Circuit the first time. It has only become now, as Republicans have become much more aggressive in their gerrymandering, um, much more aggressive in how far they think they can undermine the Voting Rights Act, that they are now trying to undo these doctrines. You know, they are now asking the Fifth Circuit to do this, but but watching this panel, you know, sort of invite that um, uh, that re that review to sort of overturn um, its own precedent, you know, I, I I don't think augurs well for where this case is going to wind up. Well, to, to that point, in terms of like these these decisions that are just kind of insane here. Talk about the lifetime ban on voting rights in Mississippi that went to the Fifth Circuit, and you alluded to this one earlier, but I think it's worth like digging into a little bit what, what's actually happening here. Yeah, so I just want everyone to first understand the states because sometimes we can get very doctrinal and it doesn't, it, it doesn't you don't appreciate what this means for real people. Um, Mississippi has a lifetime ban on voting for people convicted of felonies, okay? A lifetime ban. And it's very, very hard to get your rights restored in Mississippi. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go through all of the the um the process because it's quite elaborate, but suffice to say, it is not a state, it's not like Virginia, right? In Virginia, until Glenn Youngkin, the rights restoration process was sort of routinized. It's very hard, it's very few people get their rights restored. So in Mississippi, when they talk about a lifetime ban, they mean a lifetime ban. You're taking away people's right to vote for for their whole life. The Fifth Circuit agreed to hear this case, or not agreed, uh, heard this case, and struck it down, saying that it violates the Eighth Amendment's 
ban on cruel and unusual punishment. Seems fair enough. The Fifth Circuit has taken that case on bond, which, you know, is a tragedy for those voters. Yeah. And 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 portends and portends something worse. I mean, if if they've agreed to hear it on bonk, they've already well, right. got one, I'm sorry. Yes. one one bite at the apple with with the three judge panel. Yes, I'm sorry. I am not to assume the results based on the fact that it's been taken on bonk, but I am assuming that the Fifth Circuit didn't decide to take it on bonk because they were so feverishly in agreement <laughs> with the idea that the lifetime ban violated the Eighth Circuit that they all just all wanted to be on record. Like they all just were like, look. I want to be, I want history to judge me that I too said yeah. that this was unconstitutional. Mark, what's the long-term solution for this kind of far-right judicial activism? So I think there are a couple of solutions here. Um, the first is I do want to credit uh, the what the Judicial Conference uh, did in terms of uh, forum shopping, because some of this just starts with not allowing crazy rulings to come out of trial courts to begin with. Because oftentimes that's honestly the thing that gets the ball going. Like, I don't know whether the Fifth Circuit would would take up in the first instance a, a crazy position um, if it had been rejected by a trial court. But what is happening, I think, very oftentimes is that very, very extremist trial judges are generating these very outlandish decisions. And then the conservatives on the Fifth Circuit don't want to walk away from that. They kind of want to like double, they want to kind of lean into it. So I don't want to undermine that. But beyond that, we can talk about reforming the courts. Um, we can talk about, um, uh, we can talk about uh, uh, term limits. We can talk about, you know, all kinds of things, the Supreme Court. But really what people need, if you, if you want to solve the problems of American uh, democracy and you want to solve the problem of the American court system, vote for Democrats. You know, President Biden has a remarkable record of putting in places pro-democracy judges. He has appointed an amazing set of federal appeals court judges, including some on the Fifth Circuit. Um, he has appointed district court judges uh, with expertise and deep understanding of voting rights and other challenges Americans face. He's put in, he has a diverse set of court of appeals ju judges, like no president before him. But he's not going to be able to continue to do this unless he is reelected. And he has a Senate majority who's going to move those things. Because there's, there's one thing we learned from Mitch McConnell is the, the Senate Republicans will never move another judge of another Democrat, including another justice, um, unless, uh, as, if they are in power. Um, so, so we need everyone to, to make sure they're registered to vote, make sure their family and friends are registered to vote, and make sure they vote this November for Joe Biden and the Democratic team up and down the ballot. Look, I would just add, even if you're looking to punish Democrats or Joe Biden because they didn't do something that you wanted them to do, or you're not happy with something that they did do, this issue extends so far beyond just punishing certain Democrats based on something that they did in this term, because the impacts are going to be felt so long thereafter. Like, just look at Donald Trump, what he was able to accomplish. He put uh, uh, people like Aileen Cannon, people like Matthew Kaczynski on the court. These far right, unqualified judges will be there for the rest of their lives. And it impacts everything from women's reproductive rights to voting, to maps, to democracy itself. So again, even if you're not moved by this president or this Democratic Party, remember that the impacts that a far right judiciary will have on our democracy are so much farther reaching than than even just the president himself. Yeah, look, this is a li this is a little outside um, my usual lane, but I, I I want to address everyone on the point you just made. The Supreme Court just heard argument in a case that would ban um, uh, medication used uh, to allow women to control their own reproductive health. Okay, this is a drug that has been approved by the FDA. There is no question in the scientific community about whether it is safe or not. And a single district court judge in Texas who is fervently anti-abortion struck it down based on the, the, the arguments of a bunch of doctors who clearly don't have standing. Okay, that case was just heard by the US Supreme Court. And the good news that I hope, you know, people don't, is not the only takeaway that people get from the argument is that it seems like that's gonna get reversed. 
Okay. This case, which started with that judge, went through the Fifth Circuit, which we were just, which we are talking about, uh, and to the Supreme Court, it's going to get reversed. But here's the here's the thing: at least two justices on the Supreme Court, in their questioning of the of the witnesses, were raising the Comstock Act to basically say, "Can't isn't shouldn't it be a federal crime to allow any abortion medication to be used, sent through the mails?" Okay, that's the stakes. If you think that the stakes of the next election are that you wish Joe Biden were more pure or the Democrats had voted better on this issue or that issue, then you don't understand what the Republicans want to bring to this country. And if they are able to shape the judiciary, add more Supreme Court justices, um, uh, add more district court judge judges, uh, add uh, because, look, you know, we're complaining that that they, they go to single judges in places in Texas. They can appoint four, five, six, eight, ten more judges like that in, in these states. So it is really, really critically important that people understand uh, how bad it can get if we don't use the, the right to vote to protect our democracy. Perfectly put. We'll leave it there. Again, for those watching right now to support the invaluable work that Mark and his team do, please make sure to sign up for Democracy Docket. I'll put the link right here on this screen and also in the post description of this video. I'm Brian Tyler Cohen. I'm Mark Elias. This is Democracy Watch. Democracy Watch.